Broadcasting from the business capital of the world, this is the Podcast Business News Network. Welcome back, everybody. We all have a story. We all have a story to tell. Sometimes those stories provide some insight. They teach. In my understanding, that's called a parabell. And we're going to delve deeper into that with somebody that can help you with your communication, help you with your storytelling. The best thing you can ever do in life is to tell a great story, no matter what it is. You could be even talking about something technical within your job. There's a story. There's a flow of how it goes, how you express yourself, how you communicate, even in relationships. She helps people all the time with that. She's actually a storytelling coach and also a screenwriter. Michelle Cutler is back with us. Welcome. How are you doing? Good. Thank you. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Parabell. It's so funny. There's a restaurant near me called Parabell. So now <laughs> I, I, I wonder if there's a, some kind of connection there with that Probably. title. I don't know. Yeah. But I always wondered. I never connected it with that uh, literary term, Parabell. Am I explaining that right? A story yeah. that has a direction. You're definitely explaining it right. You're not absolutely pronouncing it correctly, though. It's it's parable, like parable, he, because yeah. the restaurant is B E L. That's why. Uh, that's what I was wondering. That's what <laughs> I was wondering. Stuck, stuck in my head. Stuck that's in my what head. I was wondering. Yeah, no, I mean, we could eat there sometime and see if we have a story to tell afterwards. I'm. But, you know uh, what? We would have a story to tell because no matter what, think about this for a second. I'm digressing, but think about this for a second. Everything we do has a story. So we go to this restaurant, Parabell, not Parabell, and <laughs> the food's great. We have a story. Food's not so great. We have a story. The server was very animated, uh, whatever it might be. We have a story. We showed up late. Oh my God, that thunderstorm is crazy. That Then we got in, but they accommodated us, even though we were late. There's a story in everything, isn't there? There is. There is, especially when you, when you step back for a moment and and in some ways, you can step back and let the story tell itself to you if you want. I mean, you can you can listen to it. You can shape it. You can find your ins and outs. I mean, most stories, the best stories have a beginning and they have an ending. Well, let's just say every story really should have a beginning and an ending. Your way in and your, your way out. Sure. Yeah. You can create those things. Sometimes they naturally occur like perfectly. And you're like, oh, this makes a wonderful story. And you can tell um, it doesn't have to be beginning, middle, end. It doesn't have to be, um, you know, the five, the hero's journey or the five acts or the three acts. It, it, it can, the story can define itself, especially if you're, if you're, if you're speaking it, if you're mm -hmm. writing it and you're writing in different genres, there are certain expectations in different genres. Um, but let's say for, for the sake of what we're doing, we're looking for in a way kind of granular, granular moments in our lives that can actually resonate much more than what they they seem to be and you can turn that into an art form and you can also look at it as a a, a way of sort of meditation or appreciation of being alive really like every day we're alive <laughs> and things are happening around us all the time um and and then it, it takes a, a point where you can look at some of those those moments or events or relationships and see how they perhaps shape you or define you or change who you are, maybe. Hmm. Do you think many of us are afraid to tell a story because we think it might fall flat? So we just pull back and we don't do it. Well, not to make it funny, but I'll bet you there are probably more people that should do that. <laughs> like the people maybe should hold back. All right, fair enough. Right? No, I mean that that could be too. I mean that's just a point of humor. We all can feel it in ourselves. Well, we hope we can all feel it in ourselves when we're trying to tell something and we know it's going nowhere or it. Um, you know, we're not exactly sure anymore why we started telling the story. You know, sometimes you lose your thread along the way. My father was a genius at the tertiary narrative, which means he would go. He would start here. He would say, hey, Michelle, guess what movie we watched last night? And I'd be like, what movie? And he would say, do you remember Uncle Aaron's cousin's son? And I'll be like, kind of. And then we'll go so far away from his original question that by the end, I'm like, 
well, what movie did you watch? What was the movie you watched last night? And he's like, oh, The Horse's Mouth. And I don't know if it has anything to do with the roundabout that went there, but for him, it obviously did. And there is a certain art to being able to go very, very far out from where you started, as long as you come back. I mean, I think a listener, an audience, a reader, if you're watching a film, they'll go a pretty long way trusting that at some point this story is going to get back on track. Maybe our attention spans are a little shorter now. You have TikTok, you have, you know, 40 word stories. There are competitions for hundred words or less stories, right? So you should be able, you, you can tell a story. There's one very short story attributed, I believe to Hemingway, although of course it's one of those things where no one can really say if he actually did it, but it was something about, um, you know, baby's shoes for sale, unused, right? And so then you, and that was it. He, it's like a baby's shoes for sale, unused. And then you can wonder so many things. Your curiosity is piqued. What happened to this baby? Why are they selling the, you know, there's, it, it's so simple and it begs a lot of questions. I think curiosity into human nature is what makes a personal narrative have potency, have power. Um, sure. And of course, the more you do it, the, the more you look at it as a craft, um, the more kind of control you have over the outcome or control that you have over your landing, like looking at the Olympics, which I love watching the Olympics. You know, when you see a gymnast stick a landing, it's just, wow, it just, it makes your heart jump. Um, I think, so there's just a... There is craft involved, but you have to play and have a really good time while you're doing it. Do you find, after having done this for many years, that when you've got something to tell, something that happened, let's and we're focusing on parable, mm -hmm. where there's something to be learned, do you personally get excited? Yeah, it's funny. As... I could say that first as the listener, as the, the receiver. I think there's something quite exciting as a receiver to hear a story where you feel like you've learned more mm. about human nature than just that individual's particular experience. So you've, it's, it's not just the details of their life or of their, of the event or whatever happened. It's something bigger than that. And so of course, as the storyteller, you know, I would want to think that if I'm telling you a story, there's a reason that more than just like, hey, listen to me. It's more than just you. I think it's this idea or this understanding that the story is more than you. You are the story. You're the storyteller. You may be the protagonist of your own story. Most often you are. But um, that there's something more there than, hey, this is what I did today. I think that happens, too, when we – there. I read for a lot of magazines, uh, literary magazines, and um, you know, hundreds of personal short stories, you know, a month. And um, there's a difference you can feel it between something that sounds sort of like a diary entry or um, a list of to dos, versus the story that has some consequence and has some tension, has some release, right? Mm -hmm. So there's there's a, diff a bit of a difference. You can feel it. It's a, you can feel it. And then of course you can understand it better to, to create it. Do you find that with, with these stories that you're just lack of a better description, you're just the messenger. This happened, you are sharing it. Now it may have happened to you, but you could have been walking down the street and you saw something that it has nothing to do with you. You are sharing the story. So essentially you are the messenger of this information your job is to give that story the best shine, be concise, be interesting, have a great start, a great ending, uh, and a lesson if it's a parable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And and it's, it's it's nice that you brought that up there because the difference between the story you tell of what happened to you and the story that you tell of it in some, they call it as told to, like in a those are air quotes as told to sometimes um, a magazine or a newspaper will ask for as told to stories, meaning you've told me a story, Steve, and I'm going to 
shape it in a way that I can share it with others as a, I'm the storyteller, but it is definitely your story as you told it to me, right? There's also, um, you know, something I observe or something I witness. Am I, am I a completely objective witness to an event or am I in some way impacted by it? I mean, I think that's why, you know, there's sort of true crime or courtroom, courtroom drama. All of these things are so fascinating to people, myself included, um, because someone's fate is resting on the account, the storytelling of a witness or of a, of a, an accomplice, or, you know, this is, that's when a story really has, you know, sort of life or death consequences. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think it's important, especially to know where you are in the story. You know, are you part of the reason something happened? Mm -hmm. Are you the, are you the receiver of something happening? Um, are you just a really good observer that you just put a few pieces together? You heard, you know, I was walking the dog the other night in the countryside and I heard a siren, like ambulance siren, which is something I'm used to hearing in the city. I'm not used to hearing it out in the countryside. So immediately I start to put together what could have happened? Who could that be? Where is it coming from? Right. And I'm a curious person and I like telling stories. So, you know, I sort of sought out what the concept of what happened, I found out it's tragic. I'm not going to share it because it's someone else's story, but you know, mm. how attentive are we to what's happening around us? I think is part of it as well. I, I find now that we're thinking about this, that whenever I share something and even if it's on social media, there has to be a benefit. This is just me. There has to be a benefit to somebody else. I'm not just going to say, hey, I'm hanging out here today. If I am, there's a reason I'm showing it to you. Like this morning in my social feed, an old post came up where I was at a restaurant and there was a, on the, on the chalkboard, you know, where they have specials and everything, it said Coors Light and Light was spelled L-I-G-T. And, you know, I just captioned it. Somebody had too many Coors Lights. But <laughs> there was something <laughs> derived from it. But I won't just put something up and I won't just tell a story unless some, I feel somebody can benefit from it. Yeah. Are all of those examples of parables? Um, I mean, a parable. So one, a really good example of a parable, which we learn in school, or mo a lot of us learn in school in the curriculum, was a story by O. Henry called Gift of the Magi. And it's fiction. It's a it's a short story. It's not a real true story um, about a couple who have uh, it's Christmas time and they have very little money between them. Uh, the woman has long, beautiful hair. That's her prized possession. The husband has a gold watch. That's his prized possession. She wants for Christmas, even though they have nothing, she wants to buy him a chain for the gold watch. He, at the same time, wants to buy her some beautiful combs for her hair, right? They, they each are thinking of each other's prized possession. What happens is she sells her hair to a wig maker to buy the chain, and he sells his watch to buy the combs for her hair. So in the mm -hmm. end, right, so that's a parable. That, like, what's more important? The gift, it's the gift of the Magi. The, the object is not as important as the... The intention right so she ends up with combs might have to grow her hair back he has a gold chain and no watch um but they love each other they've shown their love to each other um you know a lot of children's stories are parables bible stories many stories from the bible mm. are parables right because they're used to teach I don't want to say teach a lesson like in a, schol a scholastic way or an academic sure. way, but just sort of like life life lessons. And you know, every culture and background has their has theirs has their passed down stories. You know, I think we you know, we grow up in the United States. We have our school system. We have the books that we read, our curriculum, the stories. You know, the way we write an essay, for example. Um, but it's not the same for everyone, and it's really nice to read and listen outside of your comfort zone as well to hear how stories are told um, in other parts of the world and return to your own and, and maybe see something even more expansive in what you already know 
right? What is already familiar. It's a way of traveling without actually having to get on a plane. <laughs> okay, so it's game time. Okay. Time for stories. It's story okay. time. It's story time. <laughs> yeah. Well, I wanted to I wanted to share something with you um, because I've been watching the Olympics. And then I realized, though, I actually even had an Olymp when we spoke last time. I talked about um, the the knotted shoestring and Tanya Harding at the Olympics, right? So I real I must have the Olympics are on. I'm watching them. Let's just say they're in my mind. Sure. Um, and I'm very much into the sport of the Olympics, not the sensation. And swimming is one of my favorite categories. I love watching the swimming competition. Um, and what it reminded me of was a time, so I was on the swim team in high school, but I was not a swimmer. I'm not an athletic person. I'm, I do some sports, but I would never, I'm not a DNA athletic natural athlete. And what had happened in the senior year of high school and I went to an all girls public high school in Baltimore. It's one of the last, I think it's the only one in the country now. And um, my girlfriends and I, decided sort of made a, a bet to see who could be in the most yearbook photos group like club photos just photos in the yearbook of our senior year and of course that required joining clubs joining teams um, which was quite funny at first but then you actually had to do the work you had to show up and you had to <laughs> perform and so some of us signed up for the swim team and I because I'm good I'm not fast but I have a lot of endurance, it turns out. I could stay underwater for a long time. I could swim the longest. Not everyone could swim very long, but I was not fast. And um, because it was public school system, not all the schools had a very good, you know, had a very good pool. They didn't have many girls swimming, especially long distance. Teenagers aren't going to want to run swim 18, you know, 16 laps. And so I was doing quite well um, until we got to the championships, the day, the championships. And um, I just knew I had to qualify. Like I really didn't pay attention or understand the stakes. I didn't really understand the, the structure of the competition. I just knew I had to qualify. And so uh, jump in the pool, swim, and I, my heart is exploding. My, you know, my throat's on fire. I can hear all the shouting. My coach is, you know, at eye level as I could reach up and she's shouting at me and I'm like, oh my God, this is awful. I can't believe I'm doing this. This is terrible. I'm going to push through for the team. And I finished and I qualified. I think I came in fourth. I was like, yay, you qualified. Yay. And I was like, yay, I swam. But I didn't really think about the fact I had to do it again, right? Because you qualify to actually swim in the finals. I had nothing left in the tank. I had no, uh -huh. I had never, ever trained for that i never had to swim 32 laps in my life uh and i was and all my my girlfriends were excited and they were on the relay team and you know on a relay you only swim one lap and um so we go to the fine with the finals and i come in fourth i do not place i'm exhausted i've swum more than i ever have in my life and my best friends are, have a silver medal and they're cheering and they're excited and they swam maybe like two laps or something like this and at the time, the lesson, I didn't understand the lesson at the time. At the time, I was angry and jealous and thought, I just swam 32 laps and you swam two laps and you get a medal and I get nothing, right? This was sort of my, I didn't say these things, but internally I, I was just thought, this is not fair. Life is not fair. I worked harder and I didn't get the medal. Um, later, and, and that kind of taught me a lot about strategy, right? That I didn't understand the strategy going in. I just went for it. And that works sometimes. You have to have an ingredient of just going for it, like just, you know, no holding back. But there's a strategy. Um, later, and when I say later, I'm talking like 30 years later, when I thought about it again, I realized that what I didn't understand at the time and I do now is this idea of what is an accolade or what is an award or what is something that gives you this sense of achievement that I was so concerned that day about not having a medal around my neck that I didn't appreciate the fact that I swam 32 laps like I've never before or since ever <laughs> have done that and that this is like a, a for me someone who's like I say is not particularly athletic um huge you know, I just let that whole moment 
what I could have felt really good about, I just let, let, I wasted it. So I come back now and I think, okay, where are these other times in my life, perhaps where I felt cheated of something, or I felt like I did all the work, I deserve it too, you know, um, but is there something else to be gained than just simply the award or the medal? Um, of course, in the Olympics, no, there's not. You have to actually <laughs> stick the landing <laughs> to get the points to win the medal. But um, anyway, so for me, that's, that is a parable that I could craft. I could turn that into a story. I'm telling you sort of off the cuff right now, but I could write that and work that into a story. Um, of course, create a lot more tension. I could give you, you know, the feeling of when you plunge into the pool, when you're holding your breath. Um, the sound of cheering as you go underwater, you know, all these sort of atmospheric details. Um, but, but yeah, so that, to, that to me would be like a mm. parable that I could work with. And I see how there's a lesson in that for all of us. And in your defense, you didn't know <laughs> that, that you needed to leave something left in you for the next phase. Um, but you went for it. So there's a lesson there too. Sometimes you just got to go for it. May not have mm -hmm. this, the out intended outcome, but you, you, you just did it. So, hmm, interesting. Yeah. So uh, do you feel like you have any, I mean, does that ring any bells for you in terms of, of experiences that you may have had uh, that you feel have sort of a learning, a learning takeaway? I usually plan things out. So, I appreciate the part that you just dove in literally and just went for it. And again, not the intended outcome, but sometimes you just got it. And usually I plan things out. So I might've known that, well, okay, I got to, you know, to not that I could swim even, you know, a fraction <laughs> of that, but um, can I share a story? Please, please. This is going to come into the category of stop me if you've heard it, because I don't know if I shared it last time we got together, but it's fairly fresh. Um, the karaoke song story. Uh, no, you definitely did not share that yet. <laughs> OK, I like the laser. So here we go. I believe that when you ask for a sign from the universe or wherever, you're going to get it if you are aware of it. And I'm skeptical about all of that. I watch it you now. I've seen it in my journey. My mom passed five years ago. I ask for signs. I get them. They're very specific. So I had a friend pass away recently that I worked with in radio many years. We were very close. Sudden passing kind of kind of shocked me. So last week, I took my dog into town. I never do that. Something told me, you need to do this. You need to just reflect and be by yourself. So I did. And I'm walking with him and I'm just vibing my mom. I'm like, mom, show me a sign. Show me something like you've done before. Just show me some reassurance. I go to an outdoor brewery restaurant, sitting there with my dog and just listening to karaoke. People are picking songs. There's millions, bazillions of songs. The first song that somebody picks is The Rose by Bette Midler. Rose is my mom's name. Mm -hmm. So I was like, hmm. Hmm, that's interesting. Next song comes up is on the radio, Donna Summer. I worked with this woman in radio for years. It was like a highlight of my career. Two songs later, little kid gets up there and wants to sing on Spirit of Radio by the band Rush. And I'm like, oh, in 12 minutes, I was like, I think that was a sign because what are the chances of all those songs? So my feeling is ask for a sign. You need some reassurance. You might just get it because mm -hmm. I got it. I can't deny it. And even looking further, not like I'm looking for anything, but looking a little bit deeper into it a few days later, as I reflected back on it, the Rose by Bette Midler, again, my mom's name came out the year I started in radio and on the radio, when I thought about it was the year before. And that's when I actually was ever on. I won an amateur hour. That was the year, you know, the following year was when I started getting paid and I was still a kid. Um, so ask for a sign, you'll get a sign. That's, that's my, that's my lesson to be told. Okay. So I'm going to tell you something interesting. You actually did tell me that story. I didn't realize the karaoke story, but I didn't interrupt you because I wanted to hear how it evolved, which it did, which is you had the two days later, you went to look up where these songs came, the, 
clearly that if this is how if we were to work together, for example, we would develop a story is that you don't have to get it right the first time. You there's so many layers or after effects. There's so yeah. many things that that resonate with you. I think once you you shared the story with me, which I was so happy you did. And then now when you've shared it, you had it actually had more nuance to it. There were it was had more flavor because it wasn't the first time you'd said it. It doesn't matter if you re remembered you said it or not. It's that it is clearly something it developed further inside of you in your mind that you looked up the dates of the songs that you used some research. Those are tools to, for to write a story is to research. What was I thought I was born January 27th, 1971, Washington, D.C. I always assumed it was snowing. There was it's winter. It's dead of winter. I looked it up. There was no snow that day. If I want to write my, that story, <laughs> there was no snow. You Why know, did you I, assume happened when I write a screen? Why did you just, assume there was January? Been snow? January. OK, January. I mean, I just assumed and I, I was working on a screenplay recently for someone uh, also about a true story. And uh, I wrote the scene to take place, a, a scene, a parade in the middle of the day, sort of in springtime. It just seemed to be more cinematic to me. Mm. Um, I found out actually this event that it was based on took place at night in a snowstorm. And I had to completely reset what I thought was a beautiful scene ah. to be a, a, a different beautiful scene, but with snow. And of course, these things are important when you're going to shoot a movie. You have to know what, what time of day you're shooting. You have to sure. know what weather, what weather is there. But I think these things relate back to um, which is telling a story. We're not looking for production value. We're just we're yeah. we're creating an atmosphere. We're creating a world for our listener to pop into for the, the few moments that we're there with you. And then it sticks with us. We can the more it. the more we talk about this, the more I believe that there is something to be gotten from every story. Otherwise, you wouldn't tell it. Um, we're out of time here. I could just keep going. I feel like the more we, <laughs> you know, the more, and you're right. There's layers. There's many layers in in everything. Michelle, how do we how do we find you? Let's say somebody wants to improve their communication skills or storytelling skills. I believe it's everything. How do we do that? So yeah, you can reach me on my website, which is www.michellecutler.com. Um, through the contact form there, you can mention the podcast business network. We can do a 15 minute free consultation just to get a sense of what you're working on and whether you want to take it further. Um, I have a strategy session. I, I have developmental packages. I have, like we spoke about last week, last looks. When you think something's ready, you're not sure, mm. send it to me. We can do some quick polishing, some quick fixes. Um but yeah, I mean, I love, clearly I love doing this. It's a passion. I love hearing people's stories. I love working on stories with people. Um, it helps me, you know, process the world in a way that I feel is is um, more complete than just being on my own reading the newspaper. <laughs> it's important to all of us. And I learned that years ago in broadcast, the best thing you can do is effectively tell a story. It is. That's it. I mean, even in a relationship, if you tell the other person, you know, you're talking, you're communicating, you know, getting it so your point is across and all of that. Uh, thank you for today. Got a lot to think about. Oh, my here. pleasure. My pleasure. <laughs> yes. And uh, we'll talk soon. Yeah. Looking forward to it. Thanks again. Cool. Bye. Are you looking for even more of the podcasts and hosts that you love? The Podcast Business News Network is proud to announce that you now have even more ways to listen live. Check out the MyTuner Radio, Online Radio Box, and Simple Radio apps on iOS and Android, or find us online. Search for Business News Network on MyTuner-Radio.com, or search Podcast Business News Network on Streama.com and OnlineRadioBox.com slash US. Take your podcasts on the go, and don't miss a minute of the action. Broadcasting from the business capital of the world, this is the Podcast Business News Network. For nearly 2,000 severely injured veterans, everyday life has become filled with barriers. Day-to-day -day simple tasks can become pretty daunting. I have to carry my chair up two flights of steps or have somebody do it for me. What scares me the most is just the falling. When I'm struggling with my house, I think, you know, to have that one great barrier just knocked down, I mean, it's... It's crucial. Home for Our Troops is a wonderful nonprofit that builds a mortgage free, fully adaptive, handicap accessible house. And there's no catch. It'll be our very first home. 
that we've ever owned. This is a game changer. This is where your life begins again. We need you to join us in completing this important mission. Please visit hfotusa.org and help build homes and rebuild lives. Because of you, everything's going to be okay.